Welcome back. Extraordinary developments across the eastern part of Ukraine. Reports armed kidnappers have taken two Ukrainian soldiers hostage. Protesters seizing a mayor's office and Ukrainian tanks rolling under Russian flags. The question this morning, how much of this is due to Russian sympathizers or just Russians themselves? Joining me now is Anissa Naue, uh, host of In the Now and senior political correspondent for Russia Today. Anissa, thank you for joining us. Uh, there are two battles going on. There's one on the ground and there's one in the air. And by that I mean in the media about what's going on in the ground. What is your take about who is causing the trouble in Ukraine? Absolutely, I agree. The media war is rampant. Uh, first of all, it's really difficult, uh, most of all, to confirm what's coming from the ground. I'm in Moscow myself. There's lots of uh, video, lots of accusations on social media especially, and it's really hard to confirm. Last night uh, we had video of tanks rolling across Ukraine towards the east. We had uh, reports of, of gunfights, four people reportedly killed. That's really difficult to confirm. Uh, but what's coming, what the, the rule of the game that's been set up is basically that everything that comes out of Russia is automatically deemed Russian propaganda. Everything that's coming out of Kiev is automatically taken as fact, and that's where it becomes really difficult because uh, certainly the foreign ministry here in Moscow and even the Kremlin, some of their statements have been very calm to the point, yes, but they try to base them on facts, whereas uh, the stuff coming out of Kiev is also really difficult to verify. Uh, and your very own reporter I was listening earlier on the ground uh, talks about that, talks about how much misinformation and different information is coming out of eastern Ukraine at the moment. Yes, and taking that point uh, into context, uh, not painting you as a sympathizer of Russia necessarily. You're a New York native, right? You're from America, uh, even though you're in Russia now. So your perspective is going to be an interesting That's balance right. of what That's your influence right. is. CNN has the benefit of so many assets on the ground. Uh, we as reporters have benefit of the UN High Commission on Human Rights. And what we get is the picture of that what's coming out of Russia about what's causing this fomented tension is either inaccurate or by Russia's own hand, either by infiltrating the Ukraine army or having these pro-Russian sympathizers that may be just thinly masked Russian military, it does seem that blame should be on the Russian side, doesn't it? There's absolutely no evidence that those uh, so-called masked infiltrators are Russian. First of all, our reporters on the ground spoke to many of them. Uh, they showed us their Ukrainian passports. Yes, they associate themselves very closely with Russia because they speak Russian. They don't speak Ukrainian. They have ties to Russia. And so uh, Nick Patton uh, Walsh on the ground yesterday, we were listening to his report. He's saying that there's no sign, CNN's very own co correspondent, that, that these people are Russian or even a affiliated with Russian any more than the sense that they speak Russian and that they feel like their rights uh, as a minority in the country, even though in the East they're basically the majority, are being undermined by the illegal government in Kiev. But you have two counterpoints. One, most of the country speaks Russian for uh, purposes of what happened while they were part of the Soviet Union. So who speaks Russian isn't dispositive on who's sympathetic to Russia necessarily. And from the beginning, well, our Kiev reporters... Well, Kiev and Russia were one country for right. 300 years. Right. It wasn't just the Soviet Union. Right, but 300 you know what years, it was one country. Right, but the point stands. Speaking Russian is not a great indicator of whether you're sympathetic with Russia. It could be because of these 300 years of history, which you just pointed out. Also, from the beginning... Our reporters, when asking these people who had weird uniforms on that just seemed to be missing a Russian insignia, they were identifying themselves as Russia. We also know that a lot of the reports about, and it's here in the Human Rights Report from the UN, unless you want to say the UN is also wrong, that uh, reports were exaggerated, uh, that things were wrong, that it was misinformation about what Russia was putting out, about what was causing civil tension. Do you dismiss the Human Rights Report from the UN? Yeah, I read, I read those reports from the UN. I thought they made some good points. They pointed out that, that the attacks on, on uh, people who do associate self with the Russian were happening. They weren't as widespread uh, as some of the Russian journalists were reporting. Perhaps that's true, but let's not forget that the right sector uh, in Kiev 
they would have never been able to take over the government without their help, first of all. Second of all, the Svoboda Party, which is in the government right now, openly associates itself with Hitler, openly has slogans saying that Russians should burn in hell. And for a country that lost 30 million people fighting fascists in World War II, any kind of indication that this is where Ukraine going is scary to them. And they're not going to sit by and be silent. That's an understandable point of why Russia would have a very specific and sensitive interest in what happens in Ukraine. But Anissa, do you understand why that's a very different posture than saying we will influence what happens in Ukraine? We will put our troops on the border. We will have troops come in. We will take Crimea. You know, there's a difference between fearing what Ukraine does as a sovereign and then deciding to invade Ukraine because you're afraid of what's going to happen. Big difference. Let's not forget that, that Russia hasn't invaded Ukraine. Russia does have a border with Ukraine. And yes, there are military fields, military warehouses, outdoor ones, especially in rostov na which is right on the Ukrainian border. Yes, there are, is military hardware there. They haven't crossed the border. I think it's important to not misinform people that some kind of invasion is taking place at the moment. That is not happening. What is happening what is happened in Russia Crimea? is being surrounded. You have NATO just today, Rausmanson, saying that, that NATO is sending more uh, fighter jets to Romania. You have NATO troops in Romania. You have F-15s in the Baltics on the north. Uh, it's, if you want to talk about military buildup, we should look at both sides is what I'm saying. Absolutely, and that's what we're doing. But when you look at Crimea, it's hard to see that as something short of an invasion. And when you talk about why there's a military buildup, well, certainly the West doesn't want one. It fears having anything that stops the flow of natural gas and the economic exchanges that are going on with Russia right now. They don't want it. That's why sanctions haven't been put in place sooner. Certainly, you know, as a U.S. person in your background and as a journalist, that the U.S. is war weary. Certainly, the U.S. doesn't want an armed conflict here. So you must come to the conclusion that any buildup is done because more of money Russia. On military on its military than most than 16 biggest military budgets in the world. I wouldn't call the U.S. military weary. But if you, wanna, if you want me to answer your question about Crimea, again, I don't think it's fair to label it an invasion. Uh, I think that's what the mainstream media did. And again, I think it was misinformation. Uh, again, I watched CNN the day before the referendum. There were reports on your very own channel about how a majority of the population there wanted to peacefully vote to become part of Russia. No violence occurred. Listen, I understand what you're saying, and as you know, the leader of Russia, or the de facto leader of the Ukraine right now, says he's open to a referendum, but it's got to be done on their own terms as a sovereign. And the real concern is this. We all remember what happened in 2008 in Georgia. Uh, the only real material difference right now between Georgia and here is that Georgia decided to fight back. And when they did, it gave an opening for Russia to go in, and there was a lot of bloodshed. This time, the Ukraine has kept its hands up and said, we will not use force. And hopefully right now that holds because we don't want to see more bloodshed. But I do think going forward, we have to be very careful in seeing what is propaganda and what is in the influence of Russia versus just trying to give the benefit of the doubt to the unknown on the ground because we all know the next couple of steps down the road could be very dangerous ones. That's why this conversation is important. Appreciate you having it with us, Anissa. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Kate? Can we